Okay. Well, it's straight up 10 o'clock. So, Brother Barry, would you open us up, please? Amen. All right, so we left off last week. It was in the Romans 9.26, and it was Paul quoting back from Hosea. If you remember, we talked about that dual application from the Scripture. He says, And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people. <clears throat> there shall they be called the children of, of the living God. So we see, uh, I was, was showing you last time how Paul applies this thing practically to the church, but doctrinally that thing is, is, is uh, repl- applying to Israel at the second advent of Jesus Christ. And the nation is going to be reborn. That's Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones, many other passages in the Old Testament. But you have to be careful, like I said before, when you're studying the Bible and you have to understand the different um, applications of Scripture um, because if you're... If you're too rigid in one way or another, you can be, begin to get pulled off into things that are not, uh, not going to be edifying. And so uh, what he does here is he applies what's said in Hosea chapter 2, and he applies it here to the church practically. And we went back to the book of Acts and showed you those things. And uh, so let's continue on here, though, and look at the 927. He, he's, he's taking another verse out of Isaiah. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved, he, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Okay, so he, notice that right there, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea. So they're going to be a great number. Okay, and let's go back over here to Genesis chapter 22. Let's go to back to Genesis 22 and verse 17. This is right after Abraham takes Isaac up to the top of the mountain. And that promise seed, which is Isaac, right? Now look at it says in verse 17. Well, look at verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. Now, how many sons did Abraham have? Two, right? We talked about this before. Which, which one did the Lord regard? Isaac. Not the son of the bondwoman, but the son of the, right? Son of the, 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 the promised seed here, okay? But verse 17, he says this, That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gates, the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Notice the obedience. So worship is connected with obedience and sacrifice, right? Obedience first, then sacrifice. But who's his seed? Who's he talking about? Well, let's go to Galatians 4. Let's look at the spiritual seed. Or Galatians 3, uh, rather. Look at Galatians 3, 16. Notice the 3, 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. So there's the promised seed. All right. And so the, the promised seed is going to come. He's going to sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem, right? So all the, the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through that seed, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, Okay. Uh, let's go to John 12, look at 24 on that note. John 12, 24. Let's 
John 12, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth, al it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So you see how the seed, the death, the burial, and the resurrection is what he's talking about there. And he bears much fruit. And all the nations of the earth were going to be blessed through Abraham's seed, right? All right, so we got the stars of heaven, and then you have the sand which is upon the seashore, okay? So you have two different things. You have a stars, the stars of heaven, and you have the seed, the sand. So we have two different bodies, as, as Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15, remember? You have celestial bodies. I think I spelled that right. And you have terrestrial. So you have bodies in the heavenlies. All right, you have bodies down here on the earth, okay? You have temporal... And you have eternal. That eternal seed is as the stars of heaven, children of promise. But this sand down here, that terrestrial seed, that physical seed of Abraham, are they going to inherit the land? Yes. They're going to reign with Jesus Christ. However, not all that sand is going to make it. Now let's look over here in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Now what was the big thing when the Lord came the first time? What was the, what was the Jew bragging about? They're the children of Abraham. Right? They're his physical seed. They're bragging about their lineage. Well, let's look what they built their house upon. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Very familiar passage. Look at verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Notice that, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon a, on what? On the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the Winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and, it, and great was the fall of it. Now, what happened to the house of Israel after they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ? They fell. 70 A.D., Titus comes down, sacked Jerusalem, right? It was a great slaughter because they rejected the Lord Jesus. What did they build their house on? Sand. So, you can see that right there. When you build your house upon a man instead of the man Christ Jesus, when the winds blow and the floods come and the, and the troubles come in your life, you're going to falter. You're going to fall down because you built your house upon the sand of the sea. You built it on some other man other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we understand who the rock is, don't we? That's the Lord. He's the foundation. He's the sure. He's the tried stone, isn't he? You don't build your house upon sand. Ask those over there in, in England who tried to build those castles in marshes. Those things would sink. You have to build it upon bedrock. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as many as the sand of the sea, yes, but they're going to be whittled down. You remember Gideon? How many Gideon start out with? 30,000. Somebody said it. And then it whittled down to what? Well, he whittled it down to 10,000. And then finally, he whittles it down to 300. You see that remnant? And that remnant that's going to be left is the ones that believe. Let's go back to Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> Look at Romans 9, 29. Now he's making a comparison here, right? Still talking about Israel. Romans 9, 29. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of the Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been like, or been as Sodom, Samor, Sodom and bed like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then that the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law, or uh, which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, here it is, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. So who's the stumbling stone? Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch this. 
Now he's quoting from Isaiah. Once again, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 8. Look at Isaiah chapter 8. Let's look at verse 13. Isaiah 8, 13. Sanctify the Lord of hosts. Okay, so Sabaoth, you'll see it in the New Testament, that's hosts in Hebrew. Okay, when you see Lord of, Lord of hosts, it's the same as Lord of the Sabaoth. Okay, it's not Sabbath, it's, it's hosts. All right, so he says this, uh, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread, and he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel. For a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Notice this in verse 16. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among who? My disciples. That's the only time in the Old Testament that word shows up. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Now remember that priestly prayer the Lord has in John 17? The Lord gave him some, didn't he? He gave him those disciples. Right here in Isaiah is where you see it. But notice that. He says, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. What's that law? That's what he's talking about here in Romans chapter 9. That's the law of righteousness. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, on his righteousness, you, you, believe, you take his righteousness. He's made you free from the law of sin and death. And it's given by faith. Look at Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3 again. How do you receive the word? How do you receive Jesus Christ? By faith. Galatians 3.14 that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith not the works of the law believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved trusting him trusting in the rock okay so what's the, what was the Jews problem they sought it not by faith All right, they, did, they would not hear the word of God they would not hear his voice. Look at back in uh, Romans chapter 9. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling block, or stumbling stone, and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Okay. So we went through this before. Let's go to uh, Isaiah 28 now. Notice how, how much I'm going back to Isaiah. Much to be said about the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 28. Look at Isaiah 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Then that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. That's strong meat, Hebrews chapter 5. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. What's that? Scripture with Scripture. How do you want to know about the Lord Jesus Christ? You don't get it from the Talmud. You don't get it from commentaries. You get it from comparing Scripture with Scripture. Now watch this. For with the st stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom, to whom he said, this is the rest where you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Notice that in verse 11. All right, notice that in verse 11. Now when does that take place? Anybody know? All right, go to 1 Corinthians 14. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20. This is the gift on, or this is the, the rules on the speaking of tongues, which is another language. Notice what Paul quotes here. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. 
Yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them that which believe. Now notice he's quoting Isaiah 28. So what you see in the, in, in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, when they start speaking in other tongues, other languages, it was a sign to Israel. Saith what? Saith the scripture. Let's compare scripture with scripture. And that's what he's talking about in Isaiah 28. Go back to Isaiah chapter 28. To whom he said, this is the rest. He said, come, on, come unto me, all, the, all you that labor in earth, and I'll give you rest, right? Where my, wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Once again, they would not hear the word of God. When he came to them and preached, they would not hear it. Why? Their, their ears were dull of hearing. Isaiah 6.10. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here little and there little. And that they might go and fall backward and be broken and be ensnared and taken. Now what is that saying? It's saying that if you will not hear the word of God, God with the same word can deceive you. You understand? So you can come up with any heresy out of the word of God. If you don't want to believe the book, He'll let, you, he'll let you believe a lie, won't he? Is that not what happens in 2 Thessalonians 2? Okay, we've been talking a lot about hyper-Calvinism, hyper-dispensationalism, and some of them hyper-movements. Listen, they can find verses that can prove their theology. Sure, but they'll be blinded because they've got an idol in their heart. Just like that, that Jew was blinded with the idol in their heart. He said, okay, fine, I'll blind you with the same book. It'll be a snare to you. It won't, be, it won't be health to you anymore. It'll be a snare. All right, looky here. Now, so, so he says this, and they'll fall backward and be broken. So I showed you this before. So first you've got the stumbling. What do they stumble at? The stumbling stone, right? Then they fall. And then they're diminished. All right? That's what took place in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. They stumbled, they fell, then they're diminished. <clears throat> look at Romans 11. Hold your place in Isaiah 28. But look at Romans 11. This is so important for you to understand your Bible. These next couple chapters we'll get into here are essential to understanding that. Look at Romans 11.11. 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles. For to pro provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles... How much more their fullness? Now, are we a rich nation? Right? Predominantly made up of Gentiles, right? So the physical blessings and all the richness and fullness, all, that, all those things that Jew was supposed to get because they rejected the rock, God said, okay, I'll give it to somebody else. For what? For what purpose? To provoke them to jealousy? Now, I'm sure none of you have any exes that you wanted to provoke to jealousy, you know, Started going to the gym or something like that, you know, you, right? Well, look at me now. Look what I've done, right? So you can see the, the correlation there. Provoking that Jew to jealousy. When we start talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and Jehovah, and that the Lord Jesus Christ is Jehovah in the flesh, you think that makes a Jew mad? Good. Might cause him to get in the Bible and study it. That's the purpose. When you start poking that bee's nest... Good, I hope it does provoke him. I hope it provokes people to get into the book. Saying, what's he talking about? Well, read it for yourself. See what it says. All right, so look back at Isaiah chapter 28. Wherefore, uh, verse 14, Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men, that rule this people which, which is in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, we made a covenant with death and with hell, we are, at, are, at, are we at agreement? When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and understood falsehood have we hid ourselves. Now when does that take place? They believed, they believed a lie. God sent them a strong delusion. Notice who they made a covenant with. Death. 
Now, what's one of the horses, the riders, called in Revelation chapter 6? You've got death and hell followed with him. And that death is, is Satan personified. They make a covenant with that Antichrist. In the midst of that week, and we'll get into that if we teach Revelation, you'll see it right here. In the midst of that week, he'll break that peace deal with him. And when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as a woman in travail with child. That's what he's talking about. Okay, so because they rejected him, look at verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I lay in Zion for a, for a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. That's what he's quoting in, uh, in Romans 9, 33. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. All right, so he's talking about how God dealt with that Jew. You see the transition. Now we come into Romans chapter 10, the great chapter on salvation. Right? Romans 10. Now what's the number of the Gentile? Number 10. That's the number of the Gentile. All right? So here's where we get grafted in. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now did, did uh, Paul practice what he preached? His heart's desire was to see his brethren be saved, right? Remember, he goes down to Jerusalem, and the Holy Ghost told, tells him not to go, but he had it set in his heart. He's ready to die for that cause, wasn't he? But God said, you're going to Rome. Now, he writes Romans before he goes to Rome. And before he goes to Jerusalem, he writes in that letter, this letter right here, but he says, I'm going to, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm ready to die for it. And sure he was. But look at this, at verse 2, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going, to, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. So when Jesus Christ shows up, the righteousness of God shows up on this planet. It was, no, it was no longer going to be the righteousness of them keeping that law. It was going to be all based upon what they did with Jesus Christ. And so it is for you. What do you do with Christ? Are you going to stand in the judgment, the great white throne on your own righteousness? Or are you going to put on Jesus Christ and be forgiven of all things? Because he's already completed the law. He already fulfilled that law. Okay? So, but they're going about to establish their own righteousness. All right? Their do's and their don'ts, their, reg their rules and their regulations. All right? But you remember in the Old Testament, yes, they had the law and it was given for transgression. But when they transgressed, what did they have to put their faith in? Blood. Blood of bulls and goats. But what could, not, what could that not do? Could not take away sin. Because it had to be the Lamb of God. Because... The blood of bulls and goats is not eternal blood. The blood of Jesus Christ, which is God's blood, is eternal blood. Therefore, it can take away sin eternally. See the difference? So they're putting all their faith and confidence in those ordinances and sacrifices. And the whole time, those things were just nothing more than types of the real thing. And when he shows up, what did John the Baptist say? Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. See that? Righteousness, which, is of the, which was of the law, was done away in Jesus Christ. Okay? But that's what they put their trust and faith and confidence in. Look at verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now, Paul got into a lot of trouble preaching both Jew and Gentile, didn't he? That's why he gets thrown in prison in the book of Acts, because he went down there to, the, to Jerusalem, and he preached to them about Gentiles also getting saved. And at that, at that point... I think it's in Acts 21. We can turn to it. <clears throat> I think it's Acts 21. No, it might be 22. Acts 22. Look at Acts 22, verse 17. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And I saw him saying unto me, Make haste. Get thee, out, uh, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the, and the, when the blood of, thy, of the martyr Stephen, 
Thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of, of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Notice this, verse 22. And they gave him audience unto this word. And then they lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. What was their problem? Notice that the what word that gave him audience until he did what? He mentioned that Gentile. They didn't like that. They said away with him. Now I'll go to Ephesians. We went over this a little bit last night. Ephesians chapter 3. This is what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 3.1. He's talking about a habitation of God in chapter 2. He's talking about the, the, the building of God, the household of God in verse 19, 219. But he says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of, the, of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. That's why he was in prison. Right there in Acts 22 is where you see that. They didn't like that. They didn't like the fact that the house of God was going to be made up both of Jews and Gentiles. Because the Jew at that time, and they probably still do, they looked at us as what? Dogs. But how do we get in? By faith. So would the Jew have to see? Signs, wonders, and miracles, right? All right, well, let's look over here in John chapter 4. Remember the woman at the well, Samaria? Everybody knows that story. Very familiar, right? So she goes out and she begins, after she believes on the Lord, she begins witnessing to all the folks in the village, all the other Samaritans, which the Jews would have nothing to do with. Look at John 4, 30, 39. And many of the Samaritans of the, that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that I ever, ever I did. Any signs, wonders, and miracles? Nope. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard this ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now, anybody that knows anything about Samaritans, what did they have as far as Scripture? They only had the first five books of Moses. That's the only thing that they would recognize. Was that enough to get them saved? Sure was. He said, I'll rise, raise up a prophet like unto me. Hear ye him. And they heard him, didn't they? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There was no signs, wonders, and miracles done to those Gentiles. They just believed in his word. How'd you get saved? You believed his word. All right, go back to Romans chapter 10. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. They believed on him. Look at verse 5. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above? Or, who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up again from the dead? But what, say, what, what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. Now we got Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, right? Very familiar, famous passage in Romans 10, 9, there's salvation right there. But let's look, at, let's look at the passage in the Old Testament, see how it differs a little bit in Deuteronomy. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30 because that's what he's quoting from. Notice how many times Paul quotes the Old Testament and he makes application to the church. Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'm going to try to get through this in about 10 minutes. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 11. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. Notice the doing, keeping the law. 
That was to keep them in the land. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it, bring it again unto us that we may hear and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. See the choice? If they kept the land, or if they kept the law, they would stay in the land. If they broke the law, they would get expelled from the land. That's what happened under Nebuchadnezzar. Seven, Seventy years of Babylonian captivity, same thing in 70 AD under Titus. They were dispersed, and they were not brought back until 1948. They, were officially, they officially became a nation again, but he dispersed them. Why? They didn't believe God. They didn't do what he said. All right, now, and that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou put Pass us over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Now, what does the Lord say in John 14, 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He set before him life. The stumbling stone showed up. There was life. In him is life. He is eternal life. And they chose death. They made a covenant with death. And with hell they were at agreement. Now keep. Now look at this, verse 20. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him. Now, what's he saying in John chapter 10? My sheep hear my what? Voice. His sheep. The ones that believed on him. They hear his voice. Now, what's his voice? Let's go back to Psalm, Psalm 103. Look at Psalm 103 in verse 20. Psalm 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening under the voice of his word. How are they going to be judged? By his word. The Lord Jesus in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The word became flesh. He is scripture personified. He's a walking Bible. You know what you're supposed to be out in the world? A walking Bible. Are you a Christian? Are you saved? Well, that means you're to be like Christ, correct? In your conduct and everything that you do out there, that might be the only Bible that people see is you. So you have a great responsibility, don't you? You think they're going to hear the voice of God if you're acting a fool? They're just going to say, well, there's another hypocrite in the church. The Lord Jesus Christ obeyed the Father 100% and did his word. But when he showed up, they did not obey the voice. Look, let's go back to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. We're going to skip down. I'm, not, I'm going to go back through it. But look at verse 16. But they have not all all obeyed the gospel. They did not obey his voice. They did not believe on him. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? That's Isaiah 53. They did not believe the report of the Lord Jesus Christ from where? From the scripture. That's why when Paul would go into the synagogues, what would he reason with them out of? The scripture. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Some of them believed, but most of them did not believe. Why? Because they were messed up in their traditions. Well, we were talking about this last night when, uh, in the study on Galatians. One of the hardest thing to do, things to do is to pull people away from that tradition, maybe that they've been taught, 
And when you start to teach the Bible, the claws come out. And because you tell them the truth, you're now their enemy. Happens many a times. So when the Lord came, He came preaching what God the Father told Him to preach. Notice what He says in John 4 when His disciples come to Him. That same occurrence at the woman at the well. Look at John 4.34. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. And he's going to make a short work on the earth, is what he said in Romans chapter 9, right? That's his meat. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. That's Deuteronomy 8.3. So he was doing everything to the will of the Father according to the Scripture. That is what guided him in his, in his direction. And his, dest his final destination was guided by the scripture, right? Now, what was the Lord's favorite uh, title to call himself? Anybody know? Son of man, right? Son of man, son of man. He liked to refer to himself uh, as that above anything else. Look at Ezekiel chapter 2. Look at Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 1. You'll see this uh, phrase in Ezekiel more than any other book in the Bible. And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me, and he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet. And I heard him that spake unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For they are impudent children, <clears throat> and stiff-hearted. Remember what Stephen said to them? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Right? I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, that thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed, dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. This is a good passage for preachers. When you get up here and preach and, pee, and, and you look at people's faces, be not afraid of them. And thou shalt speak my words unto them. Notice what he said, his, the will, his, his meat, right? What the Father fed him. Whether they will hear, whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee, be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, a hand was set, sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was written therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and it was written there in lamentations and mournings and woe. All right, so he's eating the words of God, and he said, Speak what I tell you to speak. Preach what I tell you to preach. Thus saith the Lord God. Now look over here. He, he goes through all these things. He says, um, look, at verse, uh, look at Ezekiel 3.20. He talks about it, putting a stumbling block before that righteous man, and he commits iniquity. He's, the Lord's going to put a stumbling block. Now, who's that? The Lord Jesus Christ, right? He's going he's to trust his own righteousness. But look down here in verse 27. But when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, He that heareth, let him hear, and he that forbeareth, let him forbear, for they are a rebellious house. Now, you see that verse right there, he that heareth, let him hear? Where do you see that in the New Testament? Go to Revelation. Go to Revelation 2.7. He says that each one of the seven churches, no doubt this is doctrinally talking to that Jew in that tribulation, Look what he says in verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He says it seven times in the book of Revelation, just like he said in Ezekiel. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You know how they're going to be deceived in the tribulation? By what they see. Because you know what the Antichrist is going to show up doing? Signs, wonders, and miracles. You know what's one of those disciples that went to his own place? that was baptized, that walked with the Lord, 
and he did signs, wonders, and miracles. You better base things off of what the book says versus what you see. Because Satan knows it's very easy to deceive people by what they see. It's very deceptive, isn't it? He said, say not here, low there. When that, when they're going to be looking for the Son of Man to return. He's going to say, don't look over there. Don't look over here. I've told you before. This is where you'll find me. Amen? Amen? So, on that note, thank God we got grafted in by belief only. Because we believe the Word of God, what it says, where it says it. Amen? All right, thank you for listening this morning. We'll pick it up next week. Hopefully get through Romans chapter 10. Then we'll get into Romans 11, the graphing back into Israel, which is one of the great mysteries given to Paul. And um, we'll keep rolling along here until the Lord comes back. Amen. All right. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you for liberty in the house today. Just pray for our pastor. Pray that you bless him, Lord, and uh, help him as he stands to preach one more time. And bless our choir and our choir leader. Just continue to fill them up, Lord, and just uh, prepare the hearts to receive the message. Lord Jesus' name we pray. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen.